Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Jerry Ambrosik and Diane Babcock? Another question here is, can I compare this case to the Brian Laundry Gabby Petito case? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then I'll offer my analysis. In the summer of 1982, 19-year-old Jerry Ambrosik and 18-year-old Diane Babcock lived in British Columbia, Canada. They were romantic partners, and according to Jerry, Diane's family did not approve of this relationship. Jerry's view of the relationship was that they were star-crossed lovers. There were obstacles that were keeping them from being together the way they wanted to be. To preserve the relationship, the couple planned on making their way to South America and living in a jungle, surviving on what was available in the wild. Jerry claimed they were inspired by two movies, Tarzan the Ape Man and Apocalypse Now. Watching Apocalypse Now and wanting to live in a jungle is like watching the Shawshank Redemption and wanting to live in a prison, or watching A Nightmare on Elm Street and looking forward to dreaming. Before the couple could take their magical journey into the jungle, Diane became pregnant and had an abortion. This delayed their plan, but on August 22, 1982, they were ready to elope. They made their way to Vancouver International Airport and rented a Cessna 150. This is a small single-engine propeller-driven aircraft. Jerry had taken flying lessons, and he knew the basics of flying this aircraft. Their plan was to fly from Canada to the United States and ditch the plane in a lake. As the plane was sinking, they would exit onto a raft and make their way to shore. The plane would sink to the bottom of the lake and never be seen again. The couple took off from the airport and landed at another airport in Penticton, British Columbia. They stayed there for a little while, then they flew north away from the airport before turning southeast toward Montana. About three hours later, they reached Little Bitterroot Lake near Marion, Montana. Jerry landed the plane on the water, but it flipped over. Jerry was able to get out of the aircraft, but he became disoriented as he was trying to get Diane out of the aircraft. She could not unfasten her seatbelt, and she drowned. Amazingly, a bag full of Jerry's clothes and $2,200 that they had taken on the trip floated to the surface. He claimed this was just by chance. He grabbed the bag and swam to shore. Jerry said that after making it to shore, he spent the next few days in shock. Some people saw him on the lake shore. He collected a few rocks together, set a fire, and burned various items, like documents. He eventually left the area and took a train to New York City. As Jerry was on the run, people noticed an oil slick on top of the lake. A police officer searched the debris from the fire that Jerry set and found a component called a gust lock. This is a mechanism that locks the control surfaces of an airplane. This particular one fit the yoke of a Cessna 150. The police searched the lake and found the aircraft with Diane's body inside of it, still in the seatbelt. It was later determined that the seatbelt had not malfunctioned, but it was flipped around, which would have made it more difficult to unbuckle. At this point, the authorities in Canada were looking for Jerry and Diane. They didn't know anything about the crash in Montana. About a week after the crash, Jerry called a friend of his in Canada named Tom Pulowski. Jerry told Tom that he deliberately crashed into the lake in Montana and that Diane was still in the aircraft. Jerry said that he was calling from a bus terminal in New York City. The police did not know if Tom was telling the truth about this phone call, but they investigated and found out about the recovery operation in the lake in Montana. Now the police knew that Tom had been telling the truth, the police recorded Tom's phone line, hoping that Jerry would call back. He did, this time from a phone booth in East Dallas, Texas. Jerry had hitchhiked there from New York City. When talking about the motivation of the ill-fated trip, Jerry told Tom, I went because I was going, and she went because I guess she was in love with me or something like that. Jerry said that Diane told him she couldn't live without him. Later in the conversation, Jerry complained that he was lonely. 
Jerry informed Tom that he was not coming back to face the consequences of his actions. The authorities in Montana charged Jerry with negligent homicide, but of course they did not know where he was. After making his way to Texas, Jerry met a man who gave him a place to stay for free. Jerry established a new identity by finding the gravestone of an infant who was born within a few years of when he was born. The infant's name was Michael Lee Smith. Michael had been born in 1964 and died in 1965. Jerry was able to obtain a birth certificate using Michael's name. This allowed him to get a driver's license, social security number, and eventually a passport. Jerry became Michael Lee Smith as far as anyone knew. Jerry, now living as Michael, worked as a carpenter and earned a GED. He attended the University of Texas at Arlington and earned a degree in aerospace engineering. He was concerned about his true identity being discovered during security checks in the aerospace industry, so he switched to information technology. He started a software development company and was very successful. He bought a house in an upscale community in Plano, Texas, and even bought a $71,000 Dodge Viper. Jerry may have been able to escape justice forever, except he made a mistake when talking to his girlfriend. He told her his real name after she asked questions about some inconsistencies in his life story. She turned him into the authorities, and he was arrested at his home in Plano, Texas on August 30, 2006. Jerry was extradited to Montana to face charges of negligent homicide. In May 2007, Jerry accepted a plea deal. He pleaded guilty to criminal mischief and criminal endangerment. He was given a suspended sentence of 10 years. At this point, he was sent back to Texas to face charges of passport fraud. He spent four months in jail and was released. Jerry traveled back to Vancouver, Canada and resumed the life that he left in 1982. He should have been in trouble in Canada for stealing the Cessna 150, but the charge was dropped. He did not face any criminal liability in Canada. Jerry wrote a book called A Tear in My Life. Jerry also created a website containing information about the case. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Now moving to my analysis. There seems to be little question that Jerry was guilty of negligent homicide, even though he wasn't convicted of that crime. He attempted to land an aircraft in a lake. Any reasonable person would have known this was extremely dangerous and likely to lead to death, mostly because of the drowning part. I think the big question in this case is this. Did Jerry intentionally cause Diane's death? Many people, of course, believe that he did. Some people go as far to say that he kidnapped Diane prior to killing her. Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that Jerry intentionally killed Diane, starting with the inculpatory evidence. Jerry and Diane were both in an airplane that Jerry was piloting. He stated that he deliberately crashed into the lake in Montana. Jerry managed to escape the aircraft and collect his belongings, but Diane remained in the aircraft and drowned. Jerry claimed that he could not remove her seatbelt, but there was nothing mechanically wrong with the seatbelt. There was no damage to Diane's hands, fingers, or fingernails. One would think that if she was furiously trying to unbuckle the seatbelt, she would have sustained injuries to those areas. If they were really star-crossed lovers who could not be together, how did Diane get pregnant? Clearly, they were able to spend at least a few minutes together and had some level of privacy. Jerry called his friend Tom and made it seem as though Jerry was on the trip for himself and Diane was just tagging along. Instead of accepting responsibility for his crime, Jerry built a new life in the United States based on fraud. Even after being arrested and convicted, Jerry did not appear to have remorse. He said that he found it appalling that Diane's parents wanted him to go to prison for what he did. Furthermore, he claimed that when he was living illegally in the United States, he was a model citizen because he paid a lot of taxes. Moving to the exculpatory evidence, there was a raft in the airplane with a couple, which makes it seem as though they were preparing for a more orderly water landing, one that would have involved remaining alive after impact. Most people who fly find survivable landings to be the best. Students at the high school where Jerry and Diane attended confirmed that Diane's parents were not thrilled with the relationship. When Jerry called his friend Tom, he said he wanted Diane's body to be recovered. That's why he was calling. If he had no feelings for her at all, why would he have done this? It may have been that he was trying to get ahead of the story 
like to give his defense a chance if he was ever caught. When looking at all the evidence, do I think that Jerry was guilty of intentionally killing Diane? I don't think that he was. I think this was a case of negligent homicide. I believe Diane was there voluntarily and was a conspirator in a plan that was more dangerous than she understood. Her mistake was trusting Jerry. It's hard to imagine why the state of Montana offered Jerry a plea deal. Getting a negligent homicide conviction should not have been difficult, but maybe there were concerns about prosecuting a case that was 24 years old. I think that Jerry certainly should have gone to prison for several years, but he was able to escape any meaningful consequences. Moving to the next section. As I mentioned, Jerry created a website that contains many documents, videos, and photographs associated with this case. I will give my thoughts on a few items that stood out to me from that website. Item number one. Jerry talked about how he was born in Poland and immigrated to Vancouver, Canada at the age of 10. He talked about overcoming the language barrier and excelling both scholastically and athletically. I think this sets up the tone of the content on the website that Jerry was on a hero's journey. He was this incredible person who was destined for greatness before being victimized as part of a tragic love story. Item number two, Jerry talked about how he met and fell in love with Diane. They were inseparable, but then the environment threatened their intimate relationship. Jerry said that they were armed with youthful innocence and yearned for adventure. They wanted to leave the area in a way that minimized the impact on their friends and family members. Nothing says minimal impact more than stealing a plane and deliberately crashing it into a lake. I don't think Jerry understood the art of subtlety. Item number three, Jerry characterized his 24 years evading the authorities as a time when he was slowly piecing his life back together and trying to make sense of the accident. He claimed that the state of Montana ignored the evidence when they charged him with negligent homicide. Once again, we see that Jerry was the victim. He was trying to reassemble his life while being chased by the unjust authorities for a crime he didn't commit. He appeared to forget the part where his negligence caused the death of Diane. His narrative is all about Jerry, about his suffering. If he really loved Diane, he should have been happy to face justice. The best way that Jerry could honor Diane was to accept the consequences of his behavior. What Jerry was really saying is that he knew better than the authorities. They were somehow out to get him. They failed to understand his magical love story. Moving to the last section, the story of Jerry and Diane has several parallels to the Brian Laundry Gabby Petito case. For example, both cases involved young lovers. The female partners died due to the actions of the male partners, who ultimately escaped responsibility. Both cases started with an adventure involving a vehicle traveling to an unfamiliar place. Both involved a rural area in the Great Plains, less than 500 miles apart. Both stories involved creative interpretations by the male partners about what happened, which were really attempts to rewrite history. The men developed this fantasy of a hero's journey. Jerry claimed that only he could escape the plane. Brian Laundrie said that he killed Gabby Petito because she asked him to. There was a lot of mystery surrounding the deaths and what happened afterward. There was an unsatisfactory outcome in both cases. I find it interesting because in the Brian Laundry case, many people thought that he had a new identity and was living somewhere perhaps in a foreign country. In Jerry's case, people initially assumed that he was dead, like the plane had crashed in the mountains somewhere. In reality, Brian brought an end to his life not long after committing murder, and Jerry started a new life right after Diane died. As far as the dissimilarities, it seems clear that Brian committed first or second degree murder, although of course he was never convicted. I don't think that Jerry was as culpable as I said, I think this was negligent homicide, just as the authorities in Montana alleged. Now moving to my final thoughts. There is this sense that by rewriting history, Jerry is trying to escape feelings of guilt or shame. Even though the law did not punish him significantly, he still has to live with what he did. He is working hard to deceive himself by unsuccessfully attempting to deceive everyone else. Those are my thoughts in the case of Jerry Ambrosik and Diane Babcock, please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate 
and interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.